go up and do something again. And that's a mouthful. If you have your Bible as you stand, Psalm 51 is where we're going to start. This is a psalm written for the chief musician. David is the one that wrote it. Nathan is the one that spoke it. Bathsheba was a part of the mess that was made because of it. And when the church gathered together, just like you're gathered now, when they sang this song, everybody in that church knew that they were singing about David. The king himself was present when the song about his sin was being sung. The king, the greatest king of all of Israel, was seated in the congregation when they sang the song about his horrible sin, the adultery and the murder and the conspiracy that he committed with Bathsheba and Uriah, pulled Joab into the conspiracy and acted way out of character. And yet after he got this portion right, it didn't bother him that people were singing about what he had done because at the end of it, it testifies to the fact that God had shown him mercy and not judgment. And the psalm, if you take it in that sense of the word, actually brags on God's goodness, not David's sinfulness. I find that oftentimes that we accept the fact the Lord forgives us, but still bothers us when people remind us. David here, there's obviously four spirits that are here. There's what we're going to talk about in a minute. A right spirit is found in verse 10. There's the Holy Spirit in verse number 11. In verse number 12, you'll find a free spirit. By no means does that mean the freedom is to do whatever you want to do, but the liberty that comes after other things. And then in verse 17, you find a broken spirit. God likes a broken spirit. But there's some steps that come between getting there and staying there. Verse number one, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Transgressions are just my, literally my rebellion against you. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me from my iniquity. That's my illicit wrongdoing against someone else, doing another one wrong. <clears throat> For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. The error, the straying off the right path, the, the doing the things that I know that are clearly wrong, uh, my sin, it's ever before me. Wash me, cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Brother Larry, you pray. We need help this morning in the name of the Lord, please. set aside, please, uh, any distractions within us, just for a while, God, that we might have an open ear to hear, 
to your word. We ask you also this morning, Lord, as we do our best to bear down and ask you, Lord, that you might help our, our preacher here, your man, as he gives us the word. Lord, realizing fully that the message, realizing fully that the seriousness of the message, our Lord, is for this appointment, this meeting, and we thank you for giving it to him, God, but we realize that he's got to be used uh, to convey the message, to preach to us. So I pray, Lord, you'd help him, might you be with him, may you set aside anything, Lord, that would be fluttering, or anything, Lord, that the flesh would try to conflict, both in us and him, that the word might come through. Might your power rest on him, Lord, in a mighty way. We the word might, God, we know what that is in power in your book. So we pray for might that you might use it in, in that way. Lord, we realize fully, Lord, that uh, this is a congregation full of saved sinners. Maybe one in here that's not saved that don't know you, and we pray for them even in the same word. But help us all to pray corporately for this man as he preaches to us. We've not come here to waste time, Lord. We thank you for what we've been a part of the first hour. Brother Calvin as well coming forward. Want to be a part of the, the brethren here in this worship. Our Lord, our vision, we pray for each and every one of them. So we just need your help. We've come, we've come together, Lord, to hear from you. And we thank you for your word. The most powerful thing on this planet. Amen. The word of God. I pray you'd use it. I pray you'd use it to help us. Use your man in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Now we know that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 that the things that are written in the Old Testament are written for our admonition and our learning. We don't change Pauline doctrine to make it line up with how we feel. We don't correct those things. Many of you probably already know this. It was just recently pointed out to me. There is a new Bible that's out there, and it's called the American King James Bible. My wife happened to be looking some stuff up and trying to get some stuff for Mother's Day and other stuff that she does, and she thought, oh, it says King James, but then she paused and thought, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. Well, come to find out it is King James, but they make an American King James, so they're allowed to use King James, claim it's King James, as long as they put American before it, just like you can say New King James. They say American King James, but guess what they do? The same thing the New King James did. They change all the these and the thous and the old archaic words, and they change them to American words. I don't know why somebody would want to corrupt what's already there, especially with American vocabulary. Uh, our vocabulary, believe it or not, there may be a lot of words, but they're not always good words. But we know and make sure that you understand that as I show you these illustrations, that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. All of us have in us that are saved here today, you all have the Holy Spirit. You understand that, right? But David in the passage here had the Holy Spirit and so did Saul. Both of them were anointed as kings. Both of them had supernatural power. As a matter of fact, at one point Israel was being threatened and Saul was very brave and taking a group of men down there and wiping out the enemy in a supernatural fashion. But you read that the Spirit of God was upon the, uh, Saul back in 1 Samuel chapter number 10. And by the time you get to 1 Samuel chapter 16, David is anointed with the same exact Holy Spirit that Saul's anointed with. So both of them have the same power, the same supernatural calling from God. David says something interesting in verse number 10. He said, renew in me a right spirit. That means David had the right spirit at one time. <coughs> but something got in him. A right spirit has a propensity to help, encourage, and strengthen people. And can I say this? To draw people. And a wrong spirit has a tendency to do just the opposite. Sometimes you can tell a person has a bad spirit by 
just what the repercussions are of the actions or of being around those individuals. But here you have two great kings. Now, remember when Saul was chosen, Saul was chosen by the people, about the people, and so on and so forth. God gave them Saul because they said, we want a king like the other places have other people have a king. And Samuel said, you don't want to do that. And they said, we do. And so the Lord gave them Saul. So he is picked by God. He's head and shoulders over everyone else. And he's picked by God to do what the Lord has now ordained him to do to become the king over all of Israel. And when Saul goes out, if you'll remember, if you start maybe reading around 1 Samuel chapter number 13, he begins to make some changes in things along the way. And even after having some victories over the Philistines, uh, Saul and all of them are sitting around one day and uh, Jonathan says, hey, you know, let's go up and let's go uh, kill some uh, Philistines up there. And remember the story of Jonathan? Jonathan was a great warrior. That's Saul's son. And Jonathan goes up there, just him and his armor bearer, unnamed individual. They go up there. They climb up the rocks. They're not expecting them to come from that side. And when they get up there to the top, Jonathan winds up wiping out the entire garrison and comes back with a great victory for Israel. You read not very far at all that when they get in that position, Saul then takes credit for what Jonathan did. Saul didn't go up there. Saul didn't get his spear wet with the blood of the enemy. Saul did not make out the battle plan. Saul did not send him any support. Saul did not do anything to encourage him in the battle. Saul didn't have anything to do with it. And when Jonathan went up there and slew the other individuals, Saul was interested in taking credit for something Jonathan did. What spirit would that be? Would you say that maybe Saul was wrong in taking credit instead of saying, hey, Jonathan wrought a great victory. More importantly, should he maybe have said this? Should he might have just said, the Lord wrought a great victory and used a human instrument to do it. Amen. And just like he supernaturally empowered me over the men of Nahash, uh, he supernaturally empowered my boy and he went up there. Boy, isn't God good? Well, by the time you move into chapter number 14, he's given some specific orders, some specific things that he is required to do. And they say, listen, when you go in here with the Amalekites, we want you to destroy everything that's there. Utterly destroy all. Pretty clear instructions that are made there. And Saul goes in that particular time. You're now over into 1 Samuel chapter 15 there, and you come down there through 1 Samuel chapter number 15, and he goes in, and uh, it looks like he, right, he did, gets a great victory. As a matter of fact, to the human eye, looking at it, it looks like the partial obedience that Saul does, it looks like God's blessed him, and they've won the great victory, and that kind of a thing. And then the preacher comes in, and, but he's running late. He's not there when he needs to be and, and Saul's a little bit upset so he goes ahead and does what he wants to do and steps into that role as a priest and then when Samuel does show up Samuel says, hey, how you doing king? Uh, you kind of jumped the gun a little bit and well, you were running late preacher and anybody can be a preacher and anybody can do this. I mean, you know, I've watched you do it enough times that I, I, I realize that, well, Saul, there's he doesn't want the king and the priest to be together at the same thing. You kind of become a pope and that's not how I set it up. And, and let's just say this, Saul. Did you do what God asked you to do? I may be describing a, a, a Christian here today because in your own mind you've done what God asked you to do. But wait a minute, we have to have a measuring stick. The measuring stick cannot be our own ego. It cannot be our own self uh, uh, way of setting things up and saying, God said this, but what I believe He really meant to say was. And Saul said, yes, sir, preacher, amen, hallelujah, glory to God. God wrought a great victory. And I'm telling you now, man, you wouldn't have believed it. Uh, I mean, we did everything God said to do, right down to the very letter. And the preacher says, uh, well, if that's the case, I need to ask a question. What meaneth thee the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen in my ear? Yes, sir, yep. Yep. I mean, Saul, if you did what God said to do, 
I'm going to make a comparison, a contrast. I'm just going to tell you a, a quick story and we'll get down to brass tacks in a minute. If you did what God said to do, there should be silence now. See, partial obedience is 100% rebellion. The misunderstanding that we have today about God is, is a little bit is okay. But that's not God's way. God's an all or nothing God. I'm not a lordship salvation if it isn't, you know, if God isn't, if the Lord isn't Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. I, I, look, we all struggle with that. We know that's not true doctrine. But when God asks you to do something, He intends it to be done His way. You don't have to say why. You just do what He says to do. That obedience by faith is sometimes difficult to do. Many people pause, hesitate, try to wait to see how it's going to work out before they make a decision. I'm for make the decision before the chance for decision comes. I already know what the decision is, so the decision's much easier and I don't have to wrestle with it so much. But that's just me. And he said, well, preacher, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. But I got to talking to the people. And you know, after contacting those people, we made a decision and the people demanded of me, since I'm the big kahuna, they demanded of me to keep the best for the breeding stock, to keep the best for the nation of Israel, to keep the best uh, for us because it will be financially profitable for us to be able to keep the best. It, it does make sense to go ahead and and wean out the crop of the crippled and the blind and the lame and, and the ones with the mange and, and the older ones and the ones that are just way too young. It makes really good sense to me to do that. I, I thought that was good thinking. But you know what? After thinking about what the people said, you know, I got to thinking they got a good point. So we just kept the best. Well, they must be close to the palace, so they must not have been kept in the people's paddocks. They must have been kept in Saul's paddocks. Because the preacher heard him when he walked in to see Saul. If it was for the people, why weren't the people the beneficiary? And he said, let me ask you a Another question. Yes, sir, what is it? He said, don't you know that to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken more than the fat of rams? To, to hearken, to listen, to do what God said. Don't you know, Saul, that doing what God says is far more important than doing what you want to do? God has an unseen hand behind the scenes. He's working on something you can't see. So I know you think you know it all. But God asked you to do this for a specific reason that only He knows about. You were simply an instrument in His hand. So He is the one that put you here. It is your job to do what He told you to do, not to all of a sudden decide you know better than God knows. By the way, question number three, what about King Agag? Well, <laughs> yeah, about that. Uh, the people thought it might be a really good idea for like on festival days, days for parties, days of get-togethers, days when, you know, we're having a hard time remembering how good God's been. What a blessing it would be to bring out on a long chain that king and show him in the emaciated fashion while we've been holding him in prison and taking care of him. But we can... We can bring him out any time we want to. 
but he's still on a chain. And we can make a spectacle of him and we can laugh at him and we can mock him and, and we can put him down and, and then we put him back in his prison and it's, it's really the same thing. It's kind of split in hairs, tomato, tomato, you know, Samuel, I mean, God's kind of real like definitive, razor blade like amputate, we're done and I'm doing the same thing, but we got him over there. Samuel doesn't say, Saul, you realize he's still alive. He still has influence. And there can still be a ton of collateral damage because he continues to talk. And whether you believe it or not, he's not the one imprisoned. You're the one holding the other end of the chain. God tried to relieve you of a burden to tell you to kill him. And Saul's reasoning now, he says, well, you know, I get that, but I can handle it. Can I say this just in a practical way before I get to where I'm headed this morning? Can I say that oftentimes that's how we are when God points out things about our flesh? Yes. Amalek represents the flesh. He's a type of the flesh. We think that we can control it. We can chain it. We can hold it. The flesh has to be killed. Paul doesn't say, I wound daily. That's right. Paul said, I, I die daily. It has to be put to death. And everything that goes with it, all the animals connected to the flesh. And he says, okay, I, 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 you're, you're right. I, I, I get it. Samuel says, you know something, Saul? God's done with you. You know what Saul said? Saul did the same thing that he did with Jonathan. Here's what Saul said. Honor me now. You're right. I'm wrong. But don't tell the people. I, I, you, you got me dead to rights now. I, I, I get it. You've convinced me. Don't tell the people. Honor me. Let me still be the king. Don't let me lose face. Don't let me uh, uh, lose my position. Uh, don't let me get knocked down a few levels. After all, now remember Samuel, I'm still the king. And I'm more worried about my reputation than I am about my relationship with the king. I'm more worried about what the people think of me than what God thinks of me. And I realize now, Samuel, I have caused the people to sin. It's my fault. But don't tell them. And Samuel goes to leave because he refuses to do what the king ordered him to do. And Saul grabs his garment and 1 Samuel 15, he rips that garment. And Samuel stops and turns around and with tears in his eyes and he says, Today the Lord hath rent the kingdom from thee. There's a comparison. Saul was anointed by the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, it's interesting, even Saul could prophesy. Only thing was, Saul only prophesied when other people were around. Saul knew exactly how to play the game and could prophesy and could look like he was one thing, but when push came to shove, he was one thing in public and a whole other thing in private. He did not care about the very people because, listen, knowing God the way that you know God, you know God is not a respecter of persons. He'll punish the entire nation of Israel. He will make them walk around for 40 years in the wilderness and let all of them die because of their rebellion and think nothing of it. And Saul, knowing that, doesn't care as long as he preserves 
himself. And Christians have gotten that way in Laodicea. So blinded by another spirit. Still saved. Still anointed by the Holy Spirit. But wrong spirit. David had a right spirit. But he said, Lord, I need to renew the right spirit. Now what is the difference and what's the, the main crux of this? Well, David comes along and he's a shepherd. And he's writing psalms and he's killing bears and lions and he's even killing a giant. And God likes him. And he's a man's man. Such a man's man is he that the Bible said that when Saul sent him out to have him killed in, in, this, in, in a way he was trying to have him killed to bring 200 uh, foreskins as a dowry and all that. David brings 100, David brings 200. The Bible said about David that he could bend a bow of steel. That's, that's a man's man. Supernaturally incurred strength. Killed a giant. We understand that. Can I say this? Anointed as the king, just like Saul was anointed as the king. Both of them given the Holy Spirit. Both of them supernatural power. One of them misuses his position, his authority, his influence to cause the nation of Israel to sin. And he himself sins. David has now done something worse. Think about this now. Saul didn't commit adultery and he didn't commit murder. Why did David get a break? Doesn't that seem unfair? I mean, Saul did not commit adultery and murder. If you look at it, don't you think to yourself, well, that doesn't, that, that's kind of like favoritism. What they used to call in the old days, they called it nepotism. Doesn't that kind of feel that way to you? It's kind of like, why does David get a break? Well, I'm just going to show you something here for you to consider. Because if there was ever a day where Bible-believing Christians have fallen under the influence of another spirit it is today. Amen. Giving heed to seducing yes. spirits yes. and doctrines of devils. Yes. Things that are not biblically correct. Right. Right. But they sound right. Yes. And if you don't have a Bible, guess what happens? You fall under the Saul syndrome. Yes. And you do not care who you hurt. And it doesn't matter, and you've made up your mind. Now, you've got to be careful. Saul had an axe to grind. So everything that happened because of the Lord anointing David, everything that happened, Saul is now at a point that he thinks David is the problem. And what's he trying to do? Stick David to the chair with a spear. So much Saul, so Saul even divides against his own son and is willing to kill his own son. You tell me what spirit that is. Yeah. Saul doesn't care who it hurts. As a matter of fact, Saul is so convinced that anybody that joins up with David needs to be killed. He kills 70 priests because one gave David some bread and a sword. Oh, well, I know where it's going. You need to park that spirit for a minute and listen to me. I'm just giving you Bible. I feel the pushback. That's because you got another spirit. You're cynical, you're critical, you're skeptical, you're, I'm, I'm not sure. You call yourself a Bible believer, but when faced with a thou art the man, it's not like, well, I don't, I, hold on now, just a minute. I believe I'm justified. Saul believed he was justified for everything he did and he was justifiably wrong. He was deceived by another spirit. Saul finishes his life consorting with a witch and goes down to Gilboa and dies there committing suicide after a battle that takes place. And that is the condition of in the last days an individual that listens to a seducing spirit but they do not believe it is another spirit. It's justified. Saul forgot who put him where he was. Well, David comes along. Everybody loves David. I love David. It's my namesake. 
I was actually named after him. I know you probably are like, hey, who don't know that? Well, I'm just telling you, my, they looked through the Bible and that's who they decided to pick. I'm glad they didn't pick Judas. <laughs> they could have. I didn't have a say-so. Or one of those hushabubs or whatever it might be. I, I mean, I've met some kids before. This is hushabub and this is billabub and this is bobblebub. And I'm like, why would you do that to your kids? I'm glad they named me David. It made me inquire about David. David gets anointed. You know what David thinks of his anointing? You know what is just amazing to me? In this part, he is not like me at all. You've been anointed king. Okay, where's the throne? Where's the palace? Where's the golden toilet? Just saying. Bring on the marble floors and all that comes with being the king. He's like, uh, okay, is that it for today? Uh, okay, I, I got some sheep I got to go take care of. They've been without a shepherd now for a little while. So if you're done with the ceremony and stuff, pre thank you. Appreciate it. I got to go. I can imagine everybody else on their face. They're looking like God chose that guy. He, he doesn't even want to be it. You're right, he did it. Right. He didn't ask for it. Nobody thought he would be it, but he was. Right. And Saul calls him one day. They find out he can play a harp. There's nothing like good music to just settle you down. Amen. Just calms your spirit. Amen. The Bible said an evil spirit came upon Saul. And David came and played and the evil spirit left Saul. Boy, he had power of God on him. But he never took yeah. credit for it. He went back to tending the sheep. But he was so good at it, Saul said, you know something, he just needs to stay around here and play on a regular basis. And over a period of time, Saul gets wind that God's anointed him after 1 Samuel 15. Uh-huh. Well, here we go. We got trouble. Now that's my enemy. See, when you have the wrong spirit, you know what happens? You think everybody's your enemy. Amen. You know, an amazing thing to me about David, he had a multitude of opportunities to take Saul out. He was already anointed. And David even felt bad to the point of repentance that he cut off just a part of his outer garment. David felt he was being disloyal to the Lord and doing something that was the Lord's place to do, not his. David felt bad about it. You feel bad when you cut off part of the garment of another Christian. Does it bother you? Instead of waiting for God to handle it? Does it bother you at all in the least? To get wrapped up in that? Do you even consider it? No, they deserve it. What, what spirit is that? They get another opportunity there and cruise the water there and a spear by Saul and he's standing right there by him. Nabishai says, kill him. And David said, I'll not touch God's anointed. Drives his spear right by his head into the ground and hangs his water jug on it and goes off into the distance. Saul knows that David could have killed him and he didn't. David had the goods on him, didn't he? Yep. I'm, we're just going to test in a minute which spirit. Well, the day comes. David's bound anointed king now and he's risen up there it's interesting because when anybody's around Saul, everybody is his enemy. And he's trying to pin people to a wall, including his own people. He's killing preachers. 
He, he, everybody's a, adverse against him. They're, they're afraid. They're serving him out of fear because they're afraid he's going to kill him. I mean, he even gets ready to go against the garrison of the Philistines. And he said, we're all going to fast now. And if anybody touches any food, I'll kill him. And then finds out his own son has dipped his spear in the end of the honeycomb and his eyes were enlightened. Do you remember that story? And he said, I don't care if he's my son or not. He disobeyed my order. Wait, wait, whoa, wait. Hold, hold on, king. Wait, hold, hey, how about a little break? We had a great victory today. I mean, okay, he ate a little bit of honey. We're good. Yeah, but I said not to. Okay, well, he wasn't here when you said that. He didn't know. It doesn't matter. The law is the law. Okay. Come back and haunt you in just a little while. Now you're begging for mercy. But you didn't want to show any mercy. David, you're the king in Hebron. Okay. Who gets drawn to David? Those in debt. And those in distress. And those that had been discomfited. What spirit was that? That's the right spirit. Yes. Yes. The right spirit draws. It doesn't repel. The right spirit helps. It doesn't hurt. The right spirit maintains the position without harm to other ones. The other one is always trying to retain it because of his threats of what's going to happen if you don't. Time comes, 2 Samuel 11. Very sad discourse in the Bible. But in looking back over it, I understand when David allowed this to be penned and then he handed it to the chief musician and said, I want everybody singing this. I see David's heart there. I sinned in public and I deserve to be chastised in public and I'm no different than anybody else even if I am the king and I'm not going to hide it under a rock and act like I'm something I'm not. I'm wicked and I did wrong and I deserve death. Sing that, king. Uh, tell you what, we'll get a special choir together and we'll sing this for you in a special choir meeting just you and the people in the sanctuary. No problem. Nope. Want the congregation to learn this song. Maybe they can learn from my mistakes. David pins it out. Let's hurry to the end of the story, can we? David comes along and the time comes when men go out to war and David was a warrior and he'd always done that. He'd always gone to war. In this case, the routine duty got him. It was just the same thing he'd always done. No different today than it was back then. The time come when kings go out to war. Listen, they didn't fight when it was freezing cold outside or during monsoon season. It's just too difficult to be able to do that. So you know what happens in 2 Samuel 11? The time comes. It's springtime. It's time to get out there. There's fighting to get done. Let's get it done. And David had always saddled up and he had always gone. And he says, Joab, you take him out. You know how to do it. You don't need me anymore. You got it. And he's not where he's supposed to be. You see, ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes it's not a matter of where should we be, it's are we where we're supposed to be. And you have no way of knowing what being where you're supposed to be keeps you out of. You don't realize that the duty, the responsibility of being where I am supposed to be is not to be a burden, it's protection. Where would I be if I wasn't here this morning? You can't answer. Maybe Bathsheba be walking around naked in my sure. backyard. Sure. Oh, can't be like that. Okay. You have no way of knowing. Right. Right. I know that when God tells me to do something, I better do what I'm supposed to do. Whether I understand it or not, He's looking out for me. Amen. This is where I told you to be. Well, why? Because if you're not there, you have no idea what temptation you're going to be. 
There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But the Lord will with the temptation provide for you a way of escape. Sometimes that escape occurs because you're doing what you're supposed to do, when and where you're supposed to do it, and you don't even realize it. There was a temptation you just escaped from because you simply did what you knew was right to do. There is a responsibility and a duty to being a Christian and being where you are supposed to be. I got a free spirit. I'll be wherever I want to be. And then you wonder why some of the things happen where if I'd have been where I was supposed to be. That's right. Amen. Yes, sir. Time wouldn't permit for me to tell you how many times I've heard that. I shouldn't have been there. I knew better than to be there. I sure wish I had been. Too late now. Done. David looks upon Bathsheba. You know the story. I won't reiterate it. And at that moment, the wrong spirit takes over. Yep. He's saved. Sure. He has the Holy Spirit. But he also has a wrong spirit. Right. How do you know? I pray you take not your Holy Spirit from me. You already have a bad spirit. Did you know that the Holy Spirit and a bad spirit can reside in you? Did you know the Holy Spirit and a bad spirit could reside in Saul? Did you know that the Holy Spirit and a bad spirit could resolve in da reside in David? I want to help you this morning because the seducing spirit that anybody, most people are talking about, they're utilizing it as if it people that are already on the fringes, they're already on the edges, they're already on the outside. Well, in the cases that I'm using here, it's two kings that are talking to preachers every day. Hophni and Phineas picked up the wrong spirit. You know what they said? Oh, pfft, we can do what Moses and Aaron does. We can, there ain't no problem. We can offer strange fire. It won't be no problem. I mean, we've seen them do it a million times. Wrong spirit. Right there. They're serving in the temple every day. Just because you're in church doesn't mean you can't have the wrong spirit. Save, seal to the day of redemption. That's your soul. But you can have the wrong spirit. Can I just ask, do yourself a tough favor and look at it. Is your spirit drawing people or is it repelling people? It may not be your breath. It may be a bad spirit that can reside in a Christian. Yes. Amen, amen. I'm going to show you a contrast. When Samuel came in and talked to Saul. Saul was the people. The people. The people. The only time you find in 1 Samuel chapter 15 where Saul will take responsibility, it's done in capitulation or it's done in response to, if I admit that I'm wrong to you, let's work a deal. And what we'll do is, is if you'll bring in the, the, the defense, I mean the state attorney, and you'll work out a deal, I'll tell you what you want to know, but I want the record sealed and I don't want anybody knowing, but I'll give you the information because it'll be to my benefit and it'll cut my sentence in half. The wrong spirit never rejoices in the truth. It always tries to negotiate. Charity rejoices in truth. But Saul, in this case, is not being charitable because he's now admitting the truth, but it's in order to facilitate a deal. Okay, 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 all right, all right, all right. You got me. But honor me. I can't have a king going out there in front. Now, how are we going to spin this? Let's get a hold of the pressers. And before we put this out, let's make sure that we talk to the PIO, the, the information officer. And, and let's make sure that we spin this in our favor so that I don't wind up looking bad. But you got to fix it in such a way that it doesn't really make the people feel like they did wrong either. We got to find a common ground to 
sort of make it look like, oh, well, we just kind of made a mistake, but we're all good now. Everything's fine. That's Saul's motive. Do you see that so far? I don't need to hammer that anymore, right? The Lord has given Samuel now some inside information. Excuse me, Nathan. Nathan has to do something with it. There's a crisis on the horizon. And it's not because of the people. At this moment, it's not even because of the nation. It's because the king is cattywampus with the Lord. And he called the preacher and said, Hey, I need you to set up a meeting, make an appointment. I need you to go talk to the king. Yes, sir. What's going on? Well, I'm sure you've heard the scuttlebutt. I'm sure you've read the texts and the emails and the Instagrams and the Snapchats. And I'm sure it's noised about pretty good. Uh, you know who's living in the palace now. You know who's the king's new favorite is. Main squeeze. Nathan said, well, yes, sir, I've heard about it, but I know David, and I'm, he's kind of, you know, I guess I'll believe it when I see it. And he said, well, it's true. He said, I need you to go do something. Yes, sir, what would that be? I need you to go tell that king who has the power of life and death in his tongue and who has already committed murder, wrapped up his main general, and turned against his friends, I need you to go tell that king something from me. You don't hear a lot about Nathan. Samuel's the big dog. Nathan's not as big in the sense of that movement as... But he's the one that gets the responsibility. And you know what he says to him? I need you to go tell him three things. Three words. That's all. You put together your outline. You get ready to go and tell him however you want to tell him. But here's your ending statement. Here's your closing remark. Yes, sir, Lord, what would it be? Thou art the man. Four words, I said three, excuse me. And Nathan said, that's a tough message. That's David the shepherd. That's David the deliverer of Israel from Goliath. That's David the killer of the Philistines. That's David, he is... Saul slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. That's David, the one that plays on the harp and that I've been to church and worshiped with. And that's David who brings the temple, the, the cart down. That's David that... Whew. Whew. Uh, Lord, uh, you want to charge Israel? Nope. The guy at the top. But now, Lord, you know there's other people that have done the same thing. I mean, you know how these people are. They breed like rabbits and stuff like that. That's why you had to put in there the rules about not coveting the wife and adultery and stuff like that. I mean, so, I mean, you know, yeah, you know something, Nathan? I'd have given him anything he wanted. I'd even given him more women if he wanted them, but not another man's wife. I don't know what the conversation was. David says, Nathan says, yes, sir. And he phones up the palace and he says, I'd like to make an appointment with the king. And oh, hey, the king said he clears calendar. No problem at all. Be glad to see you. How about 12 o'clock tomorrow? Okay, sounds good to me. My calendar's clear. And he goes over there. And, hey, how you doing, preacher? Good. Good to see you. What you doing here? Well, um, I got an appointment with the king. Well, let me check with the secretary, make sure. You know, he's real busy. I don't know if he has time to talk to you. Well, I think he'll make time to talk to me. Yeah, well, I, I'm not real sure. Let me, let me call and... 
calls up to the king's secretary and the king's secretary said, yeah, it's on his book here, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that he's in there. And David said, who's that? So there's some preacher down here. And Nathan will say, oh yeah, yeah, I got an appointment. I forgot to put it on the book. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a private meeting. Nobody else needs to be there. Uh, send him on up. You know, that guy's got some great stories. Boy, he's a good preacher. He's just a, he's just a nice guy. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've heard all kind of preachers and that kind of thing, but boy, old Nathan, man, he can flat lay it down there, man. I mean, good night alive. The last outline I heard him preach. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll send him right up to you. Maybe he's got a special message for you. I, I bet he does. I've been doing pretty good now for almost a year. Things seem to be buzzing along pretty good. I mean, I know I did something I shouldn't have done, but not too bad. I mean, the baby died. It's a bad deal, but eh, well, you know, get more babies. And Absalom messed up. Yeah, I know, but he kind of made his own nest. Nathan walks in. David's sitting there and he's kind of relaxed. He's kind of casual. He's, he's got on his house shoes and his fur coat and he's sitting there leaned up on the throne, the throne he used to take so serious and how he'd sit up, you know, when the preacher came in and how he'd Think, man, this is a blessing. God sent a preacher. Now he's just kind of, hey, how you doing, preach? What's up? I'm good, you good? Be good, man. What's up, preach? You like my new Chanel shoes, double C's, man? Most comfortable shoe you ever wear, man. I'm just telling you, these are, these are great things, man. They brought these things over from Egypt, man. They're good, I'm telling you. I'll get you a pair of them if you like them. What size are you? Uh, no, sir, I'm not here to talk about your sandals there, David. What in the world could you possibly want with me as a special envoy? Is God fixing to pour some blessings down on me or something? I mean, after all, you know, uh, he likes me. Well, David, I just wanted to tell you a story. I love to hear your stories. You know, you know, Nathan, last time I heard you tell that story about old John under that log. and I was right there in the boat with you about to catch the fish. Boy, I mean, man, it's like Sunday school on Sunday morning. It's like, man, that's a blessing. He said, okay, well, David, this fella had a special man come by and he's going to feed him. The man's pretty wealthy. He's got lots of flocks of sheep and Man lives next door to him, right across the fence, just across the other side of the ball bar there. He, he's just got one little ewe lamb over there, just a little small one, a special lamb. Everybody loves him. And that's the only lamb uh, that man's ever had. And that man needs a lamb to put on the table to feed his special guest. David said, well, let me go get one out of his flock. And he said, well, I'm not done yet, king. He said, what this fellow decided to do was hop the fence and coax that little lamb over there close enough so you can almost say, well, he was on my property and, you know, he, I don't want him mixing in with my herd, my flock, and he got that little lamb just close enough that he got him. He took him up there and hung him up, cut his throat and bled him out, and skinned him out and had the butcher and the cook make him up for dinner. Boy, they sat down there and that man said, boy, it was the best meal he'd ever had. He said, the owner of that little lamb came home. The first thing he'd always do was go by the paddock and go check for his little sheep. And he went in there to check on her. And she wasn't there. And his heart sunk. And he looked to see if somebody left the gate open. And he looked to see if she'd pawed her way out from underneath the bottom rung on the fence. And he looked to see if there was any wool around anywhere. Maybe a, a wolf or another predator had gotten her. He, he was in a panic. He, his eyes are welling up with tears. And he's, he's wiping the tears out of his, out of his eyes. And he's, he, he's trying to find it. And, and he can't find it. And he comes over and he... Sorry to bother you. I know you got special guests and everything. I, I was just wondering, would you mind if I 
I walk through your flock and just see if maybe my little lamb's gotten maybe lost in here. Lost? What do you, what do you mean lost? Oh, uh, you, you lost a lamb? Oh, uh, well, uh, I'll send you some help and some servants and oh, we'll, we'll go look for that lamb. Oh, that's a terrible thing. I mean, but don't you have other lamb? No, that's my only lamb. That's the only one I have. I don't have any other lamb. I've raised that lamb since his little. That lamb means the world to me. You know what, King David? That guy said to his guest, excuse me for just a minute, and he stepped outside. And he grabbed that guy by the throat and took out his knife and he slit his throat and buried his body. He walked back in and sat down and had the lamb he had stolen. David, king, sir, with all due respect, if you were the king, what should happen to a man that's done such a horrible crime? David knows the law. David knows the Bible. David doesn't even hesitate, man. He is already foaming at the mouth because he's wondering whether or not he's being told the truth and he's ready to go find who this guy is. He said, four sheep for a sheep. That's what ought to happen. And the Lord said, okay, Nathan. Now tell him what I told you. Thou art the man. And David said, the pressures of being a king. Well, if you just understood the situation, the pressure in the palace, the people, here's the difference, the right spirit and a wrong spirit. David said, yes, sir, preacher. I am that man. And no matter what the fallout is, I deserve it. And if God takes the kingdom, or if God does whatever He chooses to do, I'd rather be in fellowship with Him than to suffer any other repercussions that I think are coming my way. And David gets the right spirit Saul dies with the wrong spirit. Preacher, why would you preach a message? Because you're living in the days of seducing spirits. And just because you're saved, it does not mean you can't have the wrong spirit. Just because you're saved, it does not mean that you can't be pushing more away than you are drawing to you. It doesn't mean that filth can't explode out of your mouth and anger out of your fists. Because you can still give heed to seducing spirits. When the seducing spirit gets a hold of you, you become self-preserving, reputation-preserving, interested in recognition. All David was is, Lord, please renew in me a right spirit. All the things in Psalms are there that we could talk about, but none of them would even have a possibility of being restored as long as he has the wrong spirit. Some of you, can I say this with, honestly with all due respect? I'm trying to help you. God hasn't moved in your life in an extremely long period of time because He will not move against the wrong spirit that you possess. And you refuse to kick that wrong spirit out because you're happy with Him sharing the place 
with the Holy Spirit. You're comfortable there. You'll retain what you want to do, how you want to do it. You have the same spirit Saul did. And it's always somebody else. It's never, it's never you. It's, if it is me, but they, that's the wrong spirit. The right spirit is, you got me. That's why David got mercy for, mur for murder and adultery. And Saul winds up committing suicide in Gilboa and dies consorting a witch. You know what the Bible said? God quit talking to Saul. He said, I have not heard neither from God nor from his prophets. God said, you got the wrong spirit. I'm pretty sure that can't help them to me. Listen, don't lean too heavily on your eternal security when it comes to communication with God. Don't get the idea in your mind that you can keep that wrong spirit and God will keep talking to you. God's going to wait for you to say, me. Guilty. Which spirit? Right spirit? Wrong spirit? Wrong spirit, preacher. Okay, good. How about you pray? Lord, renewing me a right spirit. You know what he says? Create in me, Lord, a clean heart. My sin is ever before me. David, you knew a long time ago. Can I say this? And I'm almost done. The right spirit gets ever stronger when you're obedient to it. And the wrong spirit gets ever stronger when you are obedient to it. So much so that it can so badly deceive you that you will try to pin the very people that are trying to help you, you will try to pin them to the wall. A spouse, a mom, a dad, Yes, I'll put myself in there, a preacher, a pastor, someone who's trying to help. <sniffs> Don't consider or think any at all, not consider at all, anything except self-preservation. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.